Dr. Zakia, can you explain to the viewers some of the etiquettes of reading and reciting the glorious Quran? There are various etiquettes of reading and reciting the glorious Quran. The first is, that when we recite the Quran, it should be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to seek his blessings. Number two, it's preferable that a person is pure, in taharat, he's in wudu. And third, the place where he's keeping the Quran or reciting the Quran should be clean. Number four, the time should be the best chosen time. Number five, it should be, if you're reading the Quran, preferably the direction should be towards the Qibla. Preferably, it's not a must. Number six, your intention and your concentration should be on the Quran and you should concentrate while reading the Quran. Number seven, it should be in tartil, in slow rhythmic way. Number eight, the tajweed should be correct, the makharij, the pronunciation should be good. Number nine, it should be with humility. When you're reading and reciting, it should be with humility and humbleness. Number 10, when you're reciting the Quran and reading the Quran, and if there's any verse talking about the wrath or talking about the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should seek his protection. Next, if you read any verse talking about the blessings and paradise, you should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you blessings and ask for his mercy. And if you're in the Quran, and if any verse known as the sajda talawat, verse in where you have to do sajda, at that time you should stop reading and do the sajda as soon as possible. Furthermore, some verses, it's preferable to repeat the verses as many times as possible. And lastly, you should try and remember do his of as much portion of the Quran as you can. And one important thing which is rather a fard, all the others are preferred, is that before in the Quran, you should seek refuge from Satan, the accursed, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 98, that before in the Quran, say, Auz billah min shaitan rajim. I seek refuge with Allah from Satan, the accursed. And when you are reciting any surah from the beginning, you should recite the first verse or the beginning of it, that is Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Because every surah of the Quran begins with the formula Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, except for Surah Tawbah chapter number 9. It's a fact today that the glorious Quran is the most widely read book in the world today. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. It's obviously recited by all of these people, most of these people in Arabic, and unfortunately, it isn't the language that they understand necessarily. So, the Quran is recited without understanding in many, many cases. What would you say or how could we encourage brothers and sisters to read the Qur'an with meaning and therefore being able to derive more benefit from recitation of it? You rightly said that the Qur'an has various benefits. You can keep on listing them. There are umpteen number of benefits, hundreds of them. The Qur'an is the most positive book in the world. It is a proclamation to humanity. It is a fountain of mercy and wisdom. It is a warning to the heedless, a guide to the erring, an assurance to those in doubt. It is a solace to the suffering and a hope to those in despair. How is it possible to derive all these benefits if a person does not read the Quran, if he does not understand it, if he does not ponder over the verses, if he does not implement the verses of the Qur'an and does not put it in practice. As you rightly said, that the Qur'an is the most widely read book in the world. But unfortunately, it is also the book which is maximum read without understanding. It will be a tragic misfortune if someone comes to the Qur'an 
and goes away empty handed, soul untouched, heart unmoved, life unchanged. To get the right benefit, besides reading the Quran, it's compulsory that you should understand it. You should ponder over the meaning of the Quran. You should implement the guidance which Allah has given to the humankind and put it in practice. We have two types of people amongst Ummah. Some people who think that only reciting the Quran is sufficient, and others who think that reciting is not required, only the meaning is important. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse 171, La do not commit excess in your religion. There is benefit also by reciting, but with understanding, you get multiple times more benefit. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah An-Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 45, Allah says, Recite of what we have revealed by inspiration. That means we have to recite the verse of the Quran. Utlu ma uya ilayka min al-kitabi. Recite of what we have revealed by inspiration. Further it's mentioned in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 242. Several times it comes in the Quran. La lakum ta'qilun. Do they not understand? That means it is a book to be understood. And it is important that we have to understand the book. While reading, besides reading, you should understand it. So reciting the Quran will get you many benefits. As I mentioned earlier, our beloved Prophet said, it's a Sai Hadith in Tirmidhi, Hadith number 2910, that every letter you recite of the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of the Quran, you get a reward. Each reward, you will get 10 blessings. And Alif Lam Meem is not a letter. Alif is a letter. Lam is a letter. Meem is a letter. So if it's Alif Lam Meem, you get 10, 10, 10, 30 sawab. So there is sawab in reciting. There is blessing in reciting the Quran. But as I mentioned earlier, it's not sufficient only that you have to recite. So we have to realize that both are important, but understanding and implementing is more important. Let me give an example. Suppose, you go to France for a graduation and you don't understand French. But since you know English, you know the script. When you attend the college, every day you are marked P that is present. When you sit for the examination and you don't understand a word what the teacher is saying. When you sit for the examination, you get the question paper. Since the script is the same, Maybe you can try and read by transliteration. We don't understand a word. There also in the examination you get a P. P is not for pass, it's for presence. It's only indicating that you're present for the examination, but that will not pass you. So therefore, if you want to go to Jannah, besides reciting the Quran, it's important that you even understand what Allah is telling us. Because Quran is a guidance for the whole of humanity. You understand it and you implement it on it. I'll give you one more example. Suppose there's a friend of yours, since you're living in UK, a friend of yours comes from Germany. He's a close friend of yours. He can speak some broken English. When he goes back, he writes to you a letter in German, which you don't understand. So when a close friend of yours, he writes a letter to you in German, and if you can't understand, what will you do? But natural, you'll go to a person who knows German, and have it translated because you want to know what did your friend mention in the letter. Isn't it important that we should know what our creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has mentioned in his last and final guidance, that is the glorious Quran? We don't have to go and translate the Quran. The translation is already available. So it's important that besides reading, if you can't understand Arabic, we should read the translation so that we are able to understand the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and implement on it. Makes sense. It certainly does make sense. Dr. Zakia, since there are there's so much more reward for reading the Qur'an with the understanding, why is it or what are the excuses given by Muslims, multitudes of Muslims, for not taking your advice and reading it with understanding? There are many excuses given by the common Muslim 
for not reading the Quran with understanding. And the most common is that we don't understand Arabic as a language. As you may be aware, that more than one-fifth of the world population, more than 20% of the world population, about 1.5 billion out of the 6.3 billion people in the world, they are Muslims. But more than 80% don't understand Arabic as a language. 15% of the Muslim population approximately, they are Arabs. And a few non-Arabs know Arabic as a language. So more than 80% of the Muslims, they don't understand Arabic as a language. So the most common excuse is, we don't know Arabic as a language. Now, every human being knows at least two or three languages. Some know four, some know five, some are linguists. But when a child is born, he does not know any language. But he learns the mother tongue to converse with the family members. He learns the language of the locality so that he can converse with the friends. He learns the language in which he is educated. Every human being knows at least two or three languages. Isn't it important that we should know the language in which the last and final guidance, revelation, was given by our Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Many people say that it's difficult to learn a language when we are old. But age is never a barrier for any good work. And that reminds me of the example of Dr. Maurice Bukel. Dr. Maurice Bukel, he was a French. And he was given the French Academy Award in the field of medicine. And he was selected for studying the mummy of Manapta that was found in the Valley of Kings. And when he went to Egypt while doing his research, one of the Muslims said, it's nothing great that he found the body. It's already mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 92, that Almighty God will save the body of the Pharaoh as a sign for posterity. So he was shocked that how could this book, which is so old, mention about things which we have come to recently, that the body of the Pharaoh will be saved. So that made him read the translation of the Quran. After reading the translation of the Quran, he was so impressed with the Quran, he wanted to understand the Quran directly in Arabic. So he learned Arabic as a language at the age of 50. Imagine being a non-Muslim, learning Arabic as a language to understand the Quran better. And then he writes the book, the Bible, the Quran, and science, which is a very famous book. So age is never a barrier for a person to learn a new language. But it's not possible that all of us will be as enthusiastic as Dr. Morris Pukail. According to Abdul Majid Riyabadi, he says, the Quran is the most untranslatable book in the world. It is the most difficult book to translate because the language of the Quran is so pure. It is unsurpassable. It's intangible. It is supreme. It is noble. It is divine. And many a times, one Arabic word has got several meanings. One verse of the Quran, it can be understood in very different ways. It will have a different angle for a layman when he reads it. For a scientist, it will have a different angle. So that is the reason, that is the beauty of the Quran. So to read in Arabic is the best. But for those people who don't know Arabic, alhamdulillah, there are many shayukhs, many ulama, many scholars who have translated the Quran into major different languages of the world. Most of the major languages of the world, the Quran has been translated by different scholars. So if you don't understand Arabic as a language, at least read the Quran in the language you understand the best. If you know English, read it in English. If you know French, read it in French. If you know German, read it in German. If you know Urdu, read it in Urdu. Read it in the language you understand the best. But it's a requirement that we should read the Quran in the language you understand. So there's no excuse they don't know Arabic. They read the language you understand. And Alhamdulillah, in most of the major languages of the world, you have the Quran today that it has been translated. We have the translation of the Quran in most of the major languages of the world. There are various other excuses given by Muslims that they're busy in their business, in their work, in studies. That is the reason they can't read the translation of the Quran. Many of us, we go to schools, we go to universities, to colleges, and we spend decades 
in schools, universities, colleges, and we read and memorize volumes and volumes of books, but we don't have the time to read the Quran. How much time does it take to read the Quran? If you read the translation of the Quran, and if your reading is fast, it will take a few days for you to read the Quran. If you read one juz, one part every day, it will take you one month. But unfortunately, we give excuses they don't have the time. Whatever degree you acquire in the school, in the college, it may or may not help you in this world. Many of the people, they're graduates, but they're jobless. And in the hereafter, unless this education does not get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this knowledge is useless for the akhirah. But the Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 1 and 2, Alif Lam Mim. That Alif Lam Mim, this is a book without doubt, it is a guidance for those who have faith. It is surely giving a promise that it's a guidance for you. It will help you in this world as well as the hereafter. So it's a requirement that the Muslims should read the Quran with understanding. If they don't know Arabic, read in the language they understand the best. Okay, well... There's no excuses now. <laughs> Many Muslims consider that it's only an alim or a scholar who can interpret the Qur'an and recite the Qur'an to them. Is this a correct um, understanding? Allah says in the Qur'an, in Surah Qamar, chapter number 54, no less than four times it says, in the same surah, Surah Qamar, chapter 54, verse number 17, Verse number 22, verse number 32, as well as verse number 40. وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَ الْقُرَانَ لِلْزِكْرِ فَحَلْ مِنْ مُدَّقِرِ We have made the Qur'an easy for you to remember and understand. Then which of you shall not receive admonition? So here the Qur'an says that it is easy for you to understand. And some people say it's only meant for the scholars, so there's a contradiction. Will you believe in them or will you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And Allah says in the Qur'an, in Surah Hijr, Chapter number 15, verse number 1. Alif, Lam, Ra. These are the ayats of the revelation which make things clear. That means it makes things clear. It's easy for a person to understand. But at the same time, Allah also says in the Quran, in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 43, as well as Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 7. First, Alu Ahali Zikri, in kuntum la talamu. If you don't know, ask the person who possesses the message. Ask the person who's knowledgeable. Ask an alim. So if you're reading the Quran, and while reading the Quran, if you find something difficult to understand, and ask a person who's a scholar. Ask an alim. If the Quran speaks about science, and we find any difficult understanding, who will you go to? Will you go to a cobbler? Will you go to a barber? Will you go to a scientist? If the Quran speaks about medicine, you will go to a doctor to try and understand what does the Quran say. Similarly, if you want to know about Nuzul al-Quran, or meaning of certain words of the Quran, then you go to an alim who has gone to Darul Ulum maybe for 7 years or 14 years. He is an expert in that field. The Quran says if you don't know, if you're in doubt, ask the person who possesses the message. So, it is meant for the whole of humanity, for the common man, as well as for the scholars. But while reading, if you find any difficulty, you can ask the person who's knowledgeable. And that reminds me of an example that a few decades earlier, in the late 70s and early 80s, there were a group of Arabs who followed on the guidance of the verse of the Quran. That if you don't possess the message, ask the person who has the knowledge. And they collected all the material in the Quran and the Sahih Hadith dealing with the subject of embryology. And they presented it to Professor Keith Moore. At that time, in the late 70s and early 80s, Professor Keith Moore was one of the highest authorities in the field of embryology in the world. He was the head of the Department of Anatomy in the University of Toronto in Canada. And when he was shown the verse of the Quran, along with the English translation, and he was asked that, what are his comments? So he said that most of the things that Quran speaks about embryology are 100% in conformity 
with what we have come to know recently in modern embryology. But there are a few verses which I cannot say that they are right. Neither can I say that they are wrong because I myself do not know them. And two such verses were the first verse of the Quran to be revealed, Surah Ikra or Surah Alaq, chapter 96, verse 1 and 2, which says, Ikra bismi rabbika allazi khalaq. Khalakal insana min alaq. Read, recite, and proclaim in the name of thy Lord who created, who created the human beings from something which clings a leech-like substance. The word alaqa means something which clings. It also means a leech-like substance. So Prophet Keith Moore said, I do not know whether the early stages of an embryo, embryo means the early stage of the human being that is there in the womb of the mother. Embryology is the study of the human development. He said he doesn't know whether the early stages of an embryo look like a leech or not. So he went in his laboratory and under a very powerful microscope, he observed the shape of an embryo and compared it with the photograph of a leech. And he was astonished at the striking resemblance. And later on, after reading the various verses of the Quran and the Hadith, he said, after about 50, more than 50 questions were asked to him, more than 80 questions were asked to him, and he said that if these questions were asked to me 30 years ago, he said that in early 80s, I would not be able to answer more than 50% of them because embryology is a branch of medicine which has advanced recently. And he said that he has no objection in agreeing that this book is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the word of Almighty God. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of this Almighty God. And this book, then later on, whatever additional information he got, he wrote a new book, The Developing Human, which even I had to refer when I was in the medical college in the first year, in the subject of anatomy. He wrote the third edition, for which he got an award for the best medical book written by a single author in that year. And I'd like to give you one more example, that any machine that you buy, along with it comes the instruction manual. More complicated the machine, more is the requirement of an instruction manual. If you buy a machine which is more complicated, like a computer, the more difficult it is to understand, the more requirement of an instruction manual. If you allow me to call the human beings a machine, you'll have to agree, it is the most complicated machine in the whole world. Don't you think this machine requires an instruction manual? So according to me, the glorious Quran is the last and final instruction manual for the human beings. The do's and don'ts for the human being is written in the glorious Quran. And that reminds me, once there was a Nawab of Hyderabad. Nawab is a person who is like a landlord, a very rich person. And when first time automobile was introduced in India, people did not know to drive the car. So along with the car, the company even provided the driver. So this rich landlord, Nawab of Hyderabad, he buys a new car. So the company, along with the car, provides him with a driver. So one day in the morning, he tells the driver that I want to take my wife, Begum Saiba, for shopping. Please keep the car ready. The driver says, Nawab Saib, the car is not in working condition. The Nawab gets angry and he says, I want the car immediately in working condition because I want to take my wife for shopping. The driver says, to put the car in working condition, I require 10 kgs of honey, 20 liters of milk, 30 kgs of pure ghee, and 50 kgs of rice. That also basmati rice. So the Nawab Sahib gives him 10 kgs of honey, 20 liters of milk, 30 kgs of pure ghee, and 50 kgs of basmati rice. The driver takes it and gives it to his wife, and within a few minutes, the car is in working condition. My question is that today, suppose the driver says he requires 10 kgs of honey, 20 liters of milk, 30 kgs of pure ghee, 50 kgs of basmati rice. What will you do? If he says he requires these things to put the car in working condition, what will you do? You will kick him out of the job. Because today, even though we may not know how to repair the car, we know 
that the car doesn't work on honey, milk, rice, or ghee. It works on gas. It works on petrol. So therefore, though we may not know how to repair the car, we know the basic mechanism of the car. So if everyone knows the basic meaning of the Quran, then no one will take you for a ride. So you should know the basic meaning of the Quran. And if the car gets spoiled once in a year or once in six months, then you can go to a mechanic. So why are you in the Quran if you find something difficult to understand? At that time, surely, you can go to a person who is knowledgeable and he will explain to you what is there in the Quran. And just the last example, how people, they say that why is reading the Quran is not required and should be read only by the alim, but not by a layman. They give an argument that if you have a learner's driving license, called a scratcha license over here, a learner's license, and if you bang up the car, if you have an accident, the police will give you a less fine. But if you have a permanent license, a complete license, and then if you do an accident, then the police will fine you double. Therefore, it's better not to know the Quran, not to understand the Quran. And if you do sins, then God will punish you less. If you know the Quran, and if you understand the Quran, and then if you do a sin, then Allah will punish you double. I said, I agree with you for the sake of argument. That if a person has a temporary license, a learner's license, if he has a kacha license, and if he does an accident, he'll get half the punishment. Maybe he'll be fined $1,000. But if a person has a permanent license, a complete license, and if he does an accident, he'll be fined double, maybe $2,000. But the point to be noted is that if a person who has a learner's license and has not learned driving correctly, the chance is that in one year, he'll have an accident will be maybe 50 times. But a person who learns how to drive and has a permanent license, the chance is that he'll have an accident in the full year is maybe once. So if a person who has a proper license and learns driving, he may end up paying a fine of $2,000. But the other person who has a learner's license, who bangs up the car maybe 50 times, ends up paying $50,000 at the end of the year. So yet it's preferable that you should have a permanent license. Similarly, you read the Quran with understanding and you implement on the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the chances that you will commit sins and mistakes will be less if you read understanding. Rather than saying that it's only meant for the alims, it's preferable that all the human beings, they read the Quran with understanding and implement on the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala last and final revelation which was revealed to the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Brothers and sisters, I've been enthralled and very happy to hear all the information from Dr. Zakir regarding Ramadan, the month of the Quran. I hope you have been as excited as I have today to hear all of the arguments for us to understand, read, recite and love the Quran for what it's worth. Join us tomorrow, part two of Ramadan, the month of the Quran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.